else do I have here? Oh, I have to introduce our next host, um, Jim Heil. Jim has probably been uh, one of the most influential people dealing with waste management here in Long Island. He was one of the first persons that I met dealing with uh, solid waste. And as I understand it, it can be attributed to you that you have in fact built some of the tallest places on the entirety of the island. Is that not correct? That is correct. That is in, in three different towns? Hempstead, <laughs> Brookhaven, and Isla. Yes. But uh, your favorite job was taking care of the animals in Isla. <laughs> yes. Animal shelter. You're at animal shelter. So with that experience, would you please come up and lead the next group? Thank you very much. Members of the next panel could come forward and take their place at the table while I am chatting about a side issue that uh, Carrie reminded me of was that to have so many people gathered in a room to talk about recycling. Now, back in my younger days, uh, I was commissioner in Hempstead, and we didn't do we, no one did recycle, but it was coming. Earth Day had happened. There was an emphasis on getting recycling implemented. We we're going to build, redo the waste energy plant. I needed a recycling component. So my staff and I, we put together a program, a draft program. I went to see the current supervisor at the time, Tom Galata. Tom Galata was one of the few supervisors I have worked with that was 24 hour, seven day a week politician. Pure politics. Everything was guarded by politics. Not the Democrat, Republican, but his relationship to his people. So I went up to ask for a meeting with him. Gave him the meeting, I got my suit on, my tie, went up to see him and he goes, there's gotta be trouble, you're wearing a suit. <laughs> what do you got? So I said, we've gotta do recycling, we gotta do curbside recycling, this is how we're gonna do it. And he pondered for a minute and he looked at me and he goes, Isle, you want me to tell my residents that they gotta separate their garbage? and put it out at the curb for another collection, get out of here. <laughs> and you're lucky you have a job. <laughs> so I went off and I, well, I, super, I thank you for your time. And I, so two or three months later, North Hempstead announced the program, Oyster Bay announced the program, front page of Newsday, phone rang, this is Tom. Where's our freaking program? <laughs> <laughs> so we've come a long way where we can get all these people together to talk about recycling. And unfortunately, it's a little bit, could, you know, we wish it was better times, but it's been interesting, and it's the opportunity to focus and take a good look and sort of address other problems too. So we have a very good pro uh, panel here to discuss. Uh, we have Miles Cohn, Miles Cohn, uh, Tom Alvarez, Kevin Gershwitz, my favorite. Everybody in Long Island knows Kevin. I was a pleasure to work with his father way back when. He taught me everything I know about scrap cards. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we have uh, George Smiley. <laughs> I'm very excited with you reading your bios. I'd like you, you know, we'll, we'll start with an interesting uh, presentation by you. So what? Where are we going in your particular field? What's the outlook? What are the positive stories? Another five minutes? No. Nope. Okay. So if you just say, you know, when, when the doctor's finished, say a few words about you know, yourself that you want to say, and then we'll start with Miles, who will give a few minutes about his particular interest in recycling. And then we'll go on to the last. Right? Good. Thank you. I, I can't. Uh, Himself to the next person, uh, I have to be very careful. So it won't take five minutes. Okay. okay. But uh, the Honorable Steve Engelbright is here, and I didn't see him come in the room. Steve, uh, please. <laughs> Steve uh, will be on uh, on the program a little later in the day, and he uh, one of the things he does is oversee the environmental conservation of the New York State Department.
in environmental conservation in his job. So he has a lot to do with solar waste. So, sorry. Well, I was going to say a few words about yourself. What's your Sure, and then do you want me to go into my presentation? or let Well, we'll say everybody introduce themselves and then we'll put you on. Okay, I'm Miles Cohen. I'm from Georgia. I don't sound like I'm from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm originally from the Northeast. I am the president of Fat Industries Recycling Division. Fat is the largest family-held packaging company in the world. We are the largest also 100% recycled paper packaging company in the world. And we have this little facility up in the New York area, not far from here, um, Staten Island paper mill, the only paper mill in New York City, in the city of New York. Uh, we consume two and a half million pounds of recycled paper there a day. No virgin pulp, no trees. We're fully integrated. We have a recycling division, and then we have a paper, then we have paper mills, and then we make corrugated boxes, and then we have a retail division that, that distributes and sells all those boxes, and then we pick it up all again. So we're closed loop right here in New York City. And I have with me today the Honorable Michael Altabelli, who's got about 10 months recycling experience. He's got about 40 years in the recycling industry, and he's the general manager of our, our 20 years or whatever it is. 20, he's the general manager of our Northeast uh, um, recycling. Miles, I think you can do the rest of the morning for us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I left all the jokes at home, but you know, we'll do a few of those later. Maybe. George, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, my name is George Smilo. I'm the CEO of EQ Recycling. We're in Farmington, New York. Uh, we're a division of PolyQuest Inc., which is the largest distributor of pet resins in North America. Um, the facility in, in Farmingdale uh, processes approximately 50 million pounds of soda and water bottles a year. Last year, in 2018, we actually uh, processed close to 70 million pounds, some of which did not go through the plant, but was broken. Uh, we, we, we use, uh, we're limited to materials that come through the deposit system. I know that's not a big, a big popular item here, but that's what we do. Uh, we create, we create tele, uh, flakes and pellets that go into all types of products, new bottles, strapping, fibers for clothing, um, anything that can make, be made with polyester, essentially. Thank you. I've always wondered where it went. Yeah. When I put my bottles in that machine. Kevin. It's yours. So I remember the first time I met Jim, he came to your office to see my dad. My father's response was, here's the guy who's trying to regulate us again. <laughs> <laughs> Still around. Still around. So uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Kevin Gershowitz of Gershaw Recycling Corp. And the primary is a scrap metal process. So in terms of the Long Island region, we operate 10 scrap yards. Our main facility is out in Brookhaven where we operate our, our process and plants. All of our facilities act as slaves to serve the processing plant. And we've been around for close to 60 years. When my father started the business, uh, there was an article from the town of Smithtown that they were burying cars in the landfill at the time and appliances. And while scrap metal recycling was mostly in Long Island to the industry, to the Northrop government, the Grumman's, to the factories, there was very few people doing what's known as obsolete scrap. That's why it was being buried in landfill, and that was where the vision came early on in the company. And through the years, we've grown to be where we are. Effectively, in Long Island, if it's metal, sooner or later, it's going to come to Gershaw or to a company like us. I'll explain more about that later as we talk. Tom, uh, sure, I'm Tom Outerbridge. I'm the uh, general manager for Sims Municipal Recycling. Um, Sims is a global scrap metal and electronics recycler. Um, been around for 100 years, but in the New York metropolitan area, we do uh, the, we run into the residential curbside business. Um, and so we handle 100% of the metal glass and plastic, metal glass and plastic, uh, cold nickel materials collected by the state of sanitation, and uh, along with crap, uh, also all of the paper uh, collected uh, in the city. Um, and then with that foundation, 
nation, we've also now begun to service a number of New Jersey municipalities that are taking some uh, co-mingle material uh, from all those sort of uh, local Thank you. Miles, would you like to use the podium? Sure. No, I, I'll, okay. I'll walk around if it's okay. That's good. Um, usually not a problem. Can the people in the back of the room hear me? Yeah. Yes. I use this voice at home too, which my wife uh, tells me all the time. I'm too loud, so uh, but I think here it'll work. Um, I'm going to give a little overview of Pratt. How many people in the room know who Pratt is? Yeah, the third of you. Uh, talking a little bit about what's going on in the USA market and recovered paper and export markets, China. What's going on? We hear a lot about China, China, China. So I'll talk a little bit about China. I have some updated numbers that I just got. How many of you saw my presentation in Syracuse at the DEC meeting? Shape of the meeting. Okay, you guys can leave the room. Okay, because it's very similar. There's a few changes. It's shorter, et cetera. There's a few changes. Um, but I started with this. Mark Twain, the quote, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Everybody in this room has heard that quote. Um, true story, 1897. Uh, Mark Twain was in Europe, I believe, got pneumonia. Uh, there was a paper, I think it was called the New York Journal, and they actually wrote his obituary. And um, but he wasn't dead, so it's sort of like the Dewey Beach Truman thing, right? Um, sorry. So what does this have to do with the marketability of recyclables? I am happy to inform all of you, recycling is not dead, okay? Recycling is alive and well. We got issues, we got challenges, it's not dead. The markets, some of the financial markets have collapsed, some of the issues, but it's not that. Pratt Industries, well, I mentioned this on my introduction of me, we have four 100% recycled mills, soon to be five in the United States. We do not use any trees, we do not use any pulp. People ask me all the time, how many mills do you have in Canada? How many mills do you have in Maine, in Wisconsin, and places like that? I mean, they're not. Too many trees and not enough people. We build our paper mills outside Metro Chicago is our last paper mill. The one that's being built right now is in between Cincinnati and Columbus, Wapakoneta, Ohio, <coughs> where uh, Neil Armstrong is from. And we only use recycled fiber. We are the largest user of residential mixed paper in the United States. Um, and we use about, between our four mills, about 10 million pounds a day, 365 days a year. We're open 24-7 our paper mill. We have around 68 corrugated box factories. We're fully integrated. And we have 18 material recovery facilities which Micro runs those across the country. We have the plastic, glass, um, you know, metals, everything in our material recovery facility. Some of them are single stream, some of them are dual stream, some of them are just commercial operations to handle paper rolls. We talked about circular economy, <coughs> closed the loop earlier. We are the true closed the loop company. Okay, we have burps. We collect material, we even have trucks in some areas, we have trucks in a lot of areas that collect from commercial accounts, but we do some residential pickups <coughs> and truck recyclables as well. We have our own paper mills, we have, I don't know if there's a laser on this, a pointer, but we have uh, our paper mill on the right hand side that produces rolls of paper that are 220 inches long, so almost half the width of this room, what that normally weighs 26 tons. Um, we make boxes, we make the USPS, if it fits in ships boxes, we make Amazon boxes, uh, etc. And then they're put on the doorstep of the home. We get them either from another recycler, uh, like people in this room, <coughs> or it comes back to our work, goes back to our paper mill, starts all over again. That's what we do. Okay, true circular economy company, 70 years old, has always been like that. Many of you may know the company from its previous name in the US, and our paper mill in New York by the previous name, Busy, which is not Pratt. That's a Pratt family. It's always been a Pratt family. Who do we make coordinated boxes for? Nestle Water, Amazon, Clorox, Ford. We make tens of millions of pizza boxes, our Staten Island box factory in New York, which is connected to our mill. So if you're buying a pizza on Long Island, it's a good chance it started as a newspaper in Long Island. Our New York City paper mill is the only paper mill in New York City, as I mentioned. We have box factories in Staten Island, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Reading, and New Windsor, New York. Okay, this is, I, I put this up here, I always talk about this because everything that's going on in the recycling industry is the, a lot of the troubles are in the residential side. 
<coughs> what a lot of people don't realize is if you take total recyclables of uh, the materials recyclable, I'm, just, I'm not talking about organics, I'm talk, not talking about yard waste, I'm talking about materials recyclables, paper, metal, glass, plastic primarily, okay? 23% of them come from residential households. 77% come from commercial industrial facilities. You know, we work with, we have our 18 MRFs around all the state, many states in the country, about 12 states. It always perplexes me when uh, DEQ and state EPA or whatever comes out with an announcement and says, hey, we want to start collecting information from MRFs and want to really understand how many tons of recyclables are coming out of MRFs or whatever. Most recyclables don't come out. Most recyclables will come from big distribution centers of, or, or, or box stores or grocery stores or whatever. So we, we, if we have a grocery chain that we buy from or to get cor coordinated cardboard, because we use that in our recipe to make paper too, we have distribution centers where we have 12 st stage trailers where we're taking 12 trailer trucks of baled material every single day. That's usually more than the entire county around it. Walmart alone, public information in their sustainability report recycles two and a half billion tons of cardboard a year. That's a, just a little bit less than every household in the country recycles on cardboard. One retail chain. Walmart and Target alone exceeds from their retail stores and distribution centers what every household in America recycles in cardboard. So you don't hear <coughs> shouting and screaming from the commercial industrial sector, particularly the big box stores, the Amazon distribution centers, the Walmart stores, the ShopRite stores, the Stop and Shop stores, about we can't move our recyclables. They have no problems at all. Okay, so it's just, this is a great white paper that was written in about three years ago, two and a half years ago, demystifying recycling rates. I, I'd say, hey, you should go and, and read that because it, it'll, it'll give you some good information. Um, there's a lot of misinformation on recycling rate. I say recycling rate obscurity because the EPA publishes this 34% number and everybody says, hey, we should be at 34%. The reality of it is three different organizations who are experts in recycling, EPA, EREP, and ISRI, all great organizations. I'm on the executive committee. One says 64 million tons of recyclables are collected, just materials, no organics or anything. One says 89 million tons, and one says 130 million tons. So we can't really even agree in the U.S., three major organizations, about how many tons of recyclables are really collected. So the collection rate on recyclables, on materials, 26, 27%, somewhere in that range. 77% of it from commercial industrial. Commercial industrial has like close to a 40% recycling rate. Residential has anywhere has an average of about 12% recycling rate for materials in the country. So if you're above 12% and you're a city of above 12%, you're doing a pretty good job on the material side. Again, not counting organics or any of that. Um, this happens to be a major Midwest city, 8.8%. Um, talk a little bit about China. We talk a lot about China. We know they're trying to clean up the, their environment and you know plastics and paper and all the other stuff. Um, so, you know, for us in the recycling business, we always knew that the China, China eventually wanted to be self-sufficient on collection of everything. Part of it's environmental, part of it was to be self-sufficient. And there is, there always was a movement to be more self-sufficient. And as the Chinese economy grew and the middle class grew, they're becoming more of a consumption society. And now all of a sudden they have all this problem. They have all this issue with, we don't have the infrastructure. How do we collect this paper? How do we collect this plastic? We all know what's going on with the ocean issue. Thing. So the <coughs> lady this morning who spoke from DEC, she mentioned that 5.5% prohibitives allowed. It's really driven by the Ministry of Environmental Protection, the, the MEP. Um, and basically, you know, they want to improve their situation. Okay. Here's the tonnage of residential mixed paper, because for those of you who are concerned about paper, because when you take out glass and contamination out of curbside recyclables, 79% of the tonnage left is paper. 21% of plastic and metal. 
So once you take out the glass and the, once you take out glass and contamination, 79% of what's left is paper. It's all about the paper. So back in 2015, China, we exported to China 2.8 million tons. A lot of information about this. A lot of people say 40, 50% of our recyclables went to China and they <coughs> find all these statistics. It was really number 40 to 50%. It's around in the 20 some odd percent. <coughs> but 2.8 million tons in 2015, 2016, 2.2 .2 million tons of mixed paper only went to China. 2017, last year, 1.8 million, so two, a year and a half ago. Last year, 2018, 100,000 tons. From 2.8 million to 100,000 tons in four years. It's a big decrease. So, in January through December of 2017, not this past year, 2018, but the year before, there were shipped from the U.S. exported all over the world, not only China, 18,149,000 tons of recovered paper. That's how many tons of recovered paper out of 52 million tons collected, that's how many tons of recovered paper was exported from this country. What did that number go to in 2018? How about some guesses? Zero? This gentleman says zero. Five percent of that? Five percent of that. 18 million. How many? 18 million. Who said that? 18 million. Any other guesses? One. Higher. 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 How many? 19. 19 million. <laughs> <laughs> you were in a Starbucks gift card. So. <laughs> okay. 18 million 800. These numbers just came in this week. 18,889,988 tons, 4.1% increase, plus 740,000 tons. Right? Wow. Anybody surprised by that number? Yep. He is. He is. Okay. This is all countries all over the world from the U.S. Okay, so what happened? Flight to quality. There's a 740,800 ton increase year over year between 2017 and 2018 when China said, we're not buying paper anymore. Okay, what happens is there's been a flight to quality. Okay, OCC cardboard exported up 2.4 million tons last year. Pulp substitutes, which we won't get into specialty grades of paper, about 400,000 ton increase. High grade paper, sorted office paper, that type of thing, 126,000 ton increase. Okay, mixed paper and newspaper, dropped like a rock, 900,000 tons, 1.2 million tons. But still, a lot of mixed paper was exported and a lot of news was exported. So this should all add up to some of these numbers, should all add up to 740,000 tons, but I've got to click real quick, just in case they don't. Okay. <laughs> now, what happened? Where did those countries go? Where did that material go? Okay, China reduced their imports from the U.S. by 3.3 million tons. So it is true. China's taken less from the U.S. But they're still taking well over 10 million tons of paper from the U.S. Vietnam increased 1.6 million tons. India, plus 1.4 million tons. Indonesia, 700,000 ton increase. Taiwan, 400,000 ton increase. So you got all these other countries taking, picking up part of the slack, or quite frankly, more than what China produced our continent from. Okay? So, and then, where's that coming from? Well, the top 10 ports, there's about 20 some ports in the U.S. You know, Port of Charleston, Port of Savannah, Port of Jacksonville, you got New York, L.A., you know, Wilmington, um, uh, California, Port of LA, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, you got all those, okay? Well, there were a lot of ports with decreases, and you can't read that from back there. Way on the left is Miami, had the biggest decrease, 16%, but still not 16%, it's not 100% decrease, right? And on the right hand side, for those of you who can't read it in the back, the ports with increases are. Norfolk, Baltimore, Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. Um, however, New York is the second biggest port in the U.S. for export of recovered fiber. 
And the 9.6% increase that we had in New York was the largest increase of any other port in the U.S. Last year out of New York, in 2018, we exported 354,000 more tons of recovered paper than we did the year before. So, people surprised by this? But it's high grade, it's high grade stuff. Um, the price, obviously, has dropped. You say, well, there's the tonnage up, why is the price drop? Because all these other countries <coughs> have said, hey, we can sort of exploit China not taking these tons, and, you know, we can tar the tank. And, by the way, don't expect those other countries that have increased, Indonesia, Taiwan, you know, et cetera, to continue to increase. A lot of them have built up inventories, and a lot of them have said, hey, we have a year supply now. We're, we're starting to slow down. Miles, in those countries, are those national enterprises or <coughs> private enterprises? Mostly, mostly private. <coughs> mostly private enterprises. I need to get through this because i got about five more minutes and I want to give it to my other panelists. Contamination, I don't need to cover this. Most cities report 20 to 35 percent contamination. There are some cities there that report up to 50 percent contamination in their single stream. Um, obviously, ruins good commodities, adds unnecessary expense. Um, and take, the, the biggest environmental issue is, you know, putting the garden hose in the recyclables is just taking a much longer trip to the landfill, right? So from an environmental standpoint, you have a, you have sort of a, sort of a greenhouse gas effect is that instead of it going from the household directly to a landfill or to a transfer station then to a landfill, it's going to a MRF, it's going, you know, it's taking a, a, a longer route. And it distorts recycling rate because people are counting just like we said earlier. Somebody said, hey, it's going away. Well, it's really not going away. That, that garden hose and that bowling ball <coughs> and the contamination is ending up going to the landfill through the MRF. Okay, so it's not, and many, many cities and counties, et cetera, you account for that in your recycling rate, and it's really not recycling. Okay. Wish for recycling, we talked a lot about that. We're cycling, I'm not going to talk about it, everybody knows what that is. Um, so, what I'd say is, if you're a city or town or whatever, hey, don't necessarily worry about tons or percentages. What you really need to worry about today, quality, quality, quality. Quality trumps everything. The higher the, the cities with high quality materials that are operating MRFs, even single stream or dual stream, for the most part, there's exceptions everywhere. For the most part, you have high quality material, there's a market for the material on the paper side. Um, Got to tackle contamination head on. Um, so back to quality, high recycling rates for low quality could result in the demise of programs. I read this recent article, and I'm going to read two sentences from it, one sentence. Despite the significant setback in the recycling market we are experiencing, we should view the situation as an opportunity and a challenge to reset waste management targets. Larry, from your article. Newsday, January 27th of this year, okay? One door closes, another one opens. It's an opportunity for us to tackle contamination head on. Head on. So, Carl, I don't know if you're still here. Larry, great quote. Okay? So a strong domestic market exists for paper in the U.S. We're building a paper mill. There's a couple of other companies building a paper mill. Export's not dead, but dependent on China, not longer feasible. Um, most recyclables coming from industrial sources, quality trumps everything, and quality, not quantity. So don't throw out the baby with the backwater. Get back to basics. Thank you very much. George, you're up. All right. Let's talk about plastic. <clears throat>
Again, I'm George Milo from the TQ Recycle. We're one of only two Can you use the mic? disclaimers in the whole state of New York. George, use the mic. Can you hear me? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, uh, is that better? Yes. All right. All right, so I was saying uh, we're one of the uh, two pet recyclers in the entire state of New York. Uh, there are only about 25 in the entire country. Uh, we talked about uh, numbers one and two plastics that are accepted. Um, I'm number one. Uh, We'll start from the beginning. What is PET? PET is, uh, the chemical name is polyethylene terephthalate, and, uh, which is a thermoplastic polymer also known as polyester. How did we get going? Uh, basically, we started in Farmingdale, New York in the early 90s in response to a lot of material that was being collected because of the bottle bill that went into effect in 1983-1984. Um, during that time, uh, the reverse vending machine, uh, I don't know if any of you, if any of you returned your bottles, by the way, can anybody raise their hands if they actually do return their bottles? Really? Wow. That's, that's high. Uh, most people don't. Uh, so actually the distributors, Coke, Pepsi, et cetera, at that time were very, very concerned about multiple redemption uh, because they were, they were uh, obviously have to pay a nickel for every bottle that's redeemed. So they came up with the idea of these reverse vending machines which read the code on the bottle, count it, and then shred the bottle so they can, it can never be re-redeemed. Uh, obviously we're located centrally because of the <coughs> material in Metro New York. And uh, believe it or not, um, there have been seven management entities that have operated this company since 1992. Um, the last one was TQ Recycling in 2013. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're part of PolyQuest, which is a large um, distributor of virgin pet resins and also of recycled resins. A uh, number of distribution sites and obviously the red dot on in New York is, is us. Uh, what are the benefits of using our pet? It's number one, it's the most widely recycled plastic in the world. Uh, the infrastructure is well established. Believe it or not, it can be recycled multiple times because of the nature of the polymer as opposed to other thermoplastics like polyethylene, polypropylene. Uh, <coughs> it, saves a, it saves a significant amount of energy and resources not to have to create a new bottle from scratch, uh, which also saves a lot on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We believe that we re that we produce the highest quality post-consumer polyethylene uh, polyethylene terephthalate uh, in the country. Actually, we um, I'll explain all that. We're a FDA food grade facility, um, ISO 901 certified. As I mentioned before. Uh, through, through our efforts, um, we remove about 70 million pounds or close to, or a little over 1 billion pet containers from the waste stream in 2018, uh, saving approximately a million yards of landfill space, half a million barrels of oil, 
and almost 200 million kilowatts of energy that would have been needed to produce the virgin resin and new bottles. What is our flake used for? The majority of our material uh, goes into carbonated, non-carbonated beverage bottles. I would say about 60% go into water bottles now. Uh, food and non-food containers, obviously. Uh, sheet and packaging, which I have some samples, strapping, and polyester fiber. Material source. Um, we're, we're one of the few recyclers that have the, the benefit of using only redeemed bottles that were redeemed for deposit. They're much, much cleaner uh, coming from a single loop system than, uh, re uh, than curbside collected. And a smattering of some post-commercial stuff. Um, I don't think I have to go into the whole deposit situation, but obviously you know if you buy a bottle, you pay a nickel, you bring it back, you get your nickel back. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people ask me about is, well, how do you get, what do you do with the nickel? Well, we don't get involved with that. The, uh, the reconciliation happens between the distributor and the retailer or the redemption center. We're below the line here. So after all this is said and done, um, the distributor may, might be a uh, Coke or Pepsi or Nestle or someone that sells a lot of uh, uh, beverages, uh, collects the scrap and sells it to us directly. All right, how does this work? Um, typically at a large supermarket or a box store or something like that, they collect various, con they collect the bottles, either plastic, uh, aluminum cans, and glass. They all get thrown in the same trailer. So that trailer will go to uh, some type of a transfer station. Let's see. Where? Where the, where the trailers are empty, the stuff is separated, and look at the mess. So obviously things may get contaminated in that, in that bag. So the bottles are scooped up, either by hand or by the machine. And they're bailed. So you can see the auto type bailer working as the bales are, are coming out of the machine. It's being tied automatically. A bale of this type weighs about a thousand pounds or so. This could contain as much as 30,000 containers. All right. How do we do it and why do we do it? Um, the, the the components of the bottle are very, very important in terms of how we do the recycling. The bottle itself, as I mentioned, is polyester. That's the number one. The closure and the ring may be polypropylene or polyethylene, depending on the type of container. It may be a, a generally a soft drink container has polypropylene closures, and water containers have polyethylene closures. The label is an important factor. Typically, it's made of polypropylene film, but sometimes other resins. Um, most labels have some kind of a coating on it to keep the inks from getting on your hands and also getting in the cleaning solution. Uh, they're attached typically with some type of adhesive. Hopefully, that's easy to remove. What's the process? 
So we separate the clear containers from the other. We grind the whole container or the reverse bending material into 3 8 inch flakes. We separate the closures and the labels, which are polypropylene, polyethylene, from the PET, remove the dirt, the adhesives, etc. Then we have to figure a way to remove the aluminum that got mixed in in the bales, uh, make sure the flakes are, are color sorted properly, pack out, and quality test. So this is a trailer of I, what I didn't, what I failed to mention before is the material that goes into the reverse vending machines typically are shredded um, and then they're put into these poly bags. Um, at the transfer station, they fill an entire trailer with these bags. It could be a couple of thousand bags in a trailer. What? goes into a granulator, which grinds the material. On the bale, obviously, you pick the bale up, put it in, in the machine so the key bale and the first bale up and sink it at the bottom. The bottle feed on to convert to a conveyor belt. and then get fed into the automatic box. So as the bottles enter into the lit portion, you'll see the green bottles being shot up. And you can see that. Um, so that's how there's a number of air jets on both sides to get the bottom to the clear bottom to get the clear green or dark drop bottom to get shot up and sorted. So obviously the sorted bottles now are fed into the granulator, the green bottles and one screen this is what uh, this is what a ground ground bottle look like. Uh, Contain the clear the the bottle cap, the label, any adhesive, dirt, whatever was in that bottle. We fill super sacks. And then we start the first process where the cap and the label are removed from the PET using uh, density difference. The uh, polyethylene polypropylene are lighter than water. PET is heavier than water. <coughs> and we use specialized uh, cyclone equipment to separate those two. So here you can see to the ground caps that are coming out. And these are ground labels. Both items are marketable. The caps are generally sold domestically. And unfortunately, we were speaking about China before, uh, but for 20 years we failed those labels and, I was, and they were being sold into the Asian market. Uh, that is not the case at the current time, unfortunately. But people are working on it. Uh, so now the PET flakes continue on through our wash system. It's, uh, we wash about 3 million pounds a month. Uh, it's a FDA approved system. Uh, there are a number of other separation and filtration steps to clean the flakes. After the flakes are cleaned, uh, 
deal, but other aluminum chips might be in there from getting mixed with the with the uh, cans or removed with with eddy currents. And then after that, clear plates are fed under another automatic sorting system. So there are tiny air jets, about 200 of these things, which actually shoot out the dark particles. From, from the clear. And that thing runs 24-7, seven days a week, typically. At the end of the line, we, before we pass out, we get continuous sample. You can see those flakes coming through there. And then we pack out the material in uh, these large super sacks. Each sack, um, each sack has a sample that's attached to it, uh, gets all the information, goes into our database, um, then goes through the lab through a number of different processes and testing procedures to make sure that um, the specs meet the customer uh, requirements. We'll have. So here's our finished product, clear and green flake. Typically the flake is maybe, maybe processed directly or it may be made into pellets and then shipped to various customers uh, that can make the, those products that I mentioned before. So here's kind of an interesting slide here. So. The blue bars represent the amount of bottles that were actually collected in the U.S. in these various years. Uh, the red bars indicate the amount of new virgin resin that was that was sold into the into the bottle and uh, market. So at no time in the last say. 15 years, has the return rate in the U.S. been over 30 percent? Typically it's less. Uh, these, uh, these older years, are because, the, uh, uh, be because the, the numbers were less, it's kind of skewed. But the point is that um, only 30 percent are being collected. We're, we're making about six billion pounds a year of resin that's being used into, into food and beverage bottles. And maybe 15, 1.5 billion being collected. So that means every year over the last several years, almost four billion pounds of pet bottles are going into the landfill. Uh, I don't, I don't want to bore you with statistics. Now, there are ten states in the country that have deposit systems. On the column in the right, you can see the return rate, which is anywhere from 55 to 90 odd percent, depending on the state. So obviously, there's there's a big differential in the return rate. Um, between the deposit states and the non-deposit states. So if, if the total return rate is more or less 28% nationwide, and the return rate in the deposit states is 60, 65, 70 average, obviously the non-deposit states are returning somewhere 15 to 20%. And I can assure you that every pound that's collected in these systems is going into, into pet reclaimers because we actually fight over the materials and pay a lot of money for it.
I don't know if you could see this, but this is the story of my life. <laughs> uh, I, by the way, I was in the soda business for over 10 years before I was in the recycling business. So what this, what this represents is the average flake, the average <coughs> clear flake price over the last 30 years or so per pound. And the uh, orange line represents more or less the break-even price. So, do I have to explain? By the way, the two the two times when the we were making money, I mean serious money in the business, was back in the mid '90s uh, when there was a worldwide shortage of pet uh, because it was a relatively new. Um, you know, a new business. And then in the mid 2000s, <coughs> due to the water bottle explosion. <coughs> so it's a tough business, and somebody has to buy it. Um, some challenges. You know, we're talking about expo uh, expanding the deposit system. I wanted to make a point here. Um, as I mentioned before, the traditional method of recycling is removing the label and the cap and separating it from the, fat, uh, from the pet and creating a nice clear uh, pet flake. Um, bottles like these, which have may have PVC or uh, what they call PET G, which is a, that's a type of PET that's not really compatible with PET, with the regular PET, uh, makes a bottle like this very, very difficult to recycle. There's also another, another issue with some of these bottles that um, some of them, especially uh, like sports drinks and juices and teas may have other types of com compounds in, built into the resin that acts as uh, like an oxygen barrier or to maintain quality. The problem with it is once you put it into the process, you heat it up, it looks like that. That's not good. Can't sell. Another issue are bottles with self-adhesive labels. These labels do not re release very well, so the product is downgraded because we have pet flakes that are coming through the system with the labels intact. They're almost impossible to remove. Another issue are colored pet bottles. This color is it's essentially trash. If this material gets into a clean, clear stream and you process it, it turns it cloudy and white, so it's, it's essentially <coughs> trash. Those are some of the problems that, we, that we, have, we may have to deal with. As even <laughs> as silly as, an, as a pet bottle with an aluminum top, um, that's, that's crazy. But the uh, people, uh, you know, marketing comes up with all these great ideas and, and labels and graphics and whatever. Sometimes it's, it's detrimental to the, to the uh, recycling business. One other, on one other note, the collection rate in Europe is two to two and a half times what it is in this country, 60 to 70 percent. We have, we have the infrastructure in place to take a lot more bottles. We need increased collection. I just wanted to one, go quickly go through this, so it's not to bore you. Um, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember the old Coca-Cola bottle in the, the glass bottle. When uh, I remember when I was a child, 
Uh, these machines were ubiquitous, and every gas station had a machine, and they were all over. You put your nickel in or whatever it was, you got a two pound you got a two pound glass bottle with a couple of ounces of soda in it, and you couldn't really walk away with it because um, you had to use the bottle opener in the machine. And then you would take the bottle and put it back in the in the uh, in the wooden case because otherwise they would charge you uh, two cents. But anyway, uh, so in the 1960s. There was, a, there was an event called the Soda War. I don't know if anybody if you remember that, but Coke and Pepsi were trying to increase their, were fighting amongst themselves to increase market share. Uh, so they started this new, new idea of non-deposit bottles. No return, no deposit, no return. They kept, uh, so now they had to thin the, thin the glass uh, in order to uh, accept more and more liquid. And back in the late uh, 60s, the, the bottles got so big, they were half-gallon bottles. They weighed about five pounds, or even more, maybe six pounds. And there was a huge problem with liability. They were breaking and exploding all over the place, which, uh, which resulted in, in the pet bottle, the plastic bottle. Um, by the 1970s, because of all the litter, 10 states were enacted bottle bills. And so that's how we move from glass to the glass to plastic. Um, <coughs> by, the, uh, by the 90s, glass was, pra was practically uh, obsolete. Um, so there was a worldwide shortage of PET, which drove prices crazy. Um, then, as always, when that situation happens, a lot of money goes into it goes into the industry, uh, and then resulting in an oversupply situation. So we have we have this kind of situation between virgin resin and recycled resin. You know what is the what is the relative value, and that's that's part of the problem that we have. Uh, so, so the recycling rates are, you know, are part of that problem because there's not enough demand to take all the all the resin. Uh, in other countries, in Europe and Canada, the government does give help to the recycling industry in various ways. Obviously, that's not the case here. So maybe we're at a point now where some kind of collaboration is necessary. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I can talk about it. We'll hold questions until the end. Okay? Sure. Good. Uh, we're to stay in order of uh, these materials, we're going to present Tom Outerbridge from Sims as the next presenter, and uh, then we'll follow up with complete with Kevin. So just to complicate things further, uh, in New York we are that we're sort of we're above 50 percent recycling rate for the materials that are meant to be recycled. So I guess that puts us better than the uh, national average of 20 percent or whatever. It is. How's that? That work? So I get to talk about glass, which, based on this morning's keynote and the ocean plastics should be our favorite material. Unfortunately, in the recycling world, it's one of our least favorite materials because of a whole variety of reasons. Um, um, and in New York City, um, this photo, by the way, is of uh, um, 
last we over the past six months or so, we've um, converted about or sold our our glass to a company that makes blast medium. We've sent about twenty thousand tons of glass converted into blast medium, which there's been conversations in Long Island about whether or not glass can be turned into beach sand. I defer to other people on the chemistry of that, but I can tell you aesthetically there's no problem getting there. I, I can't speak to the cost of that and whether or not that's ever going to be economical to, to make uh, glass to replenish the beaches, but certainly technically I think you can get there without a problem. And people do it. They just sell this blast medium into the blast market, but it's in excess of $100 a ton at that point. So as I mentioned in the early March, we do handle 100% of the New York City curbside material. We also take some commingled material from Long Island. Uh, now that some of the municipalities have gone back to dual stream programs, we take the metal glass plastic fraction, or in some cases just the metal plastic fraction, uh, and, and as well as uh, we take bale plastics from MRFs that are making mixed bales, mixed plastic bales, one through seven, three through seven people call it, uh, and process that into, uh, segregate that into resins for domestic markets. On the glass front, we basically, by necessity, have gotten into the glass business through the New York City program and the other curbside material we get. We handle about 10 to 12,000 tons a month of glass. Um, and that volume necessitates and basically justifies some investment in a lot of sorting equipment. Um, uh, you, someone mentioned paste glass earlier this morning. We're similar in that way in that we color sort glass into uh, clear glass. Uh, which gets sold back to the container market. A green amber mix known as Gramber in the container market goes back in the green or amber bottles. Uh, and then what is what we cannot color separate either because the machinery is imperfect and also uh, when you get down below a certain particle size, uh, you cannot color separate it. The machinery doesn't work. What we cannot color separate, we, um, we clean up and grind and make into a, a glass aggregate glass aggregate, which we use in a large-scale construction projects in, in the New York area. So there's a, a, but we are basically color sorting probably about 40% of the glass we have with a balance going into that aggregate product. That's a green amber mix, a uh, flint mix, or flint clear as it's known. I would just say basically this is, you know, I think that this, I, I guess I'm here to sort of talk about what can be done with glass, but to be realistic, there's a, definitely a scale associated with this. A small, that's why these glass plants are quite centralized, paste, strategic, cap glass in Pennsylvania. They, they're basically handling tens of thousands of tons a month to justify uh, the optical sorting equipment. And also, in addition to optical sorting, you basically run it through an x-ray machine. We can't have any leaded glass or any heat-resistant glass, so a broken coffee pot or Pyrex container. If that gets in there, that must be ejected because by nature it's heat resistant. It is heat resistant. It won't melt in the glass furnaces. Uh, they basically those, the tolerances for those are in the parts per million. Um, and we also have to pull out any stone ceramic porcelain, which also don't melt in the, uh, in the if it's melted. So we have the ability, the luxury, really. We've got um, some area in Jersey that allows us to stockpile our aggregate, um, and that's. Uh, also necessary for the types of jobs we go after. They don't want generally 10, 20, 100 cubic yards. They want 10,000 cubic yards in the course of three weeks or a month. So, so we stockpile our aggregate. We test it depending on wh what the application is, what the regulatory environment is. Sometimes there are engineering characteristics that they want to test, porosity, compaction, so forth. And sometimes it's an environmental, uh, to, to meet an environmental standard, whether it's in New Jersey, uh, residential clean, uh, clean fill standards. In New York, we have a beneficial use determination. So we've done projects directly with DOT uh, based on simply sieve size, particle size, and uh, organic content. But also we're doing a project, or we're working on a project now with the uh, Port Authority in New York where they're looking for a whole host of uh, environmental testing. Generally, the aggregate is, a, and this is, if it's in the New York State specs, it's in New York City DOT specs, it's a pretty, actually, I would say certainly regionally throughout New England, you can find a, a spec in there. It's generally minus three-eighths is what they're looking for with an organic content less than uh, 5%. Just some photos of some of the projects we've done. Uh, again, some DOT work, state DOT, city DOT. In New Jersey, there's a lot of 
we're doing quite a few waterfront projects where because of new FEMA flood, flood levels and standards, they're elevating some of these large industrial sites. They're looking to bring in clean fill, uh, not necessarily for structural properties, but just to simply elevate the site. And also a lot of pipe bedding work. Um, again, some, we did a big turnpike project with, with, uh, with uh, the uh, Turnpike Authority in New Jersey. They consumed about, I think, about 80,000 tons. So put that in perspective, that's basically New York City's production of uh, beer and wine and mayonnaise jars for about a year. Goes into the turnpike. Um, so other things, these are uh, some of these things we, we, we have done. For example, that blast medium, people talk about sand blasting. They don't use sand anymore. Sand uh, has free silica. It's got health hazards. Uh, they, but, but blast medium is generally slag, things like that. And we, so we, like I said, we, we sent about 20,000 tons of our aggregate material to a processor who's further refining that into a blast medium. But that is an option. Um, lightweight aggregate, for those of you who don't know, there's a company outside Philadelphia doing very interesting things where they basically bake the glass and they make a lightweight aggregate, which has, I think, quite a few applications. It's not my expertise, but certainly in the, in the road construction where they're looking to do embankments and things like that without adding the weight. Um, and uh, fiberglass, we're talking with, there's two major manufacturers of fiberglass in the US, and uh, we're doing samples with both of those. The big markets for glass outside of the aggregate business are really, really fiberglass and containers. These other ones, lightweight aggregate, glass medium, are more niche markets. Not to say they aren't relevant, but they're, but they're definitely smaller. Uh, and then cement, which is basically if you pulverize glass into a powder, basically, like flour, it becomes cementitious. It actually becomes a substitute. You mentioned ash in your building over here that doesn't exist at, what, 80%? Uh, content rate. Well, this is what they're talking about with, with you pulverize. It's a scientific exercise, but that's actually a demo plant up north of New York. And there's, I think the first <coughs> commercial scale plant will be going in in Connecticut uh, in the next year or so, where they will, you can substitute pulverized glass for uh, fly ash or uh, slag <coughs> as, as, a, as an additive to Portland cement. And if you look at climate change, what do they say? They say a ton of cement equals a ton of CO2. There's an enormous amount of CO2 associated with, with, uh, with making cement. And so I think that's another thing. It's not there yet, uh, but that is the, if that comes to pass, the quantities of cement that are consumed and the potential environmental benefits for swapping out uh, crushed glass or pulverized glass for, for uh, Portland cement, uh, that could consume all the glass uh, certainly that we're, we're, lo we're looking at in the residential sector. What proportion are you looking at? In other words, what proportion of the mixture would be the pulverized glass as compared they're, to I think they're, well, I think they're, they're trying, they're, they've, do, they've done tests in New York at a 20% rate or so, 20% of the Portland cement swapping <laughs> out. I think they, they've actually tested up to 30 or 40, but I think what they're trying to go through all of their ASTM testing and approvals and so forth at a 20% substitution rate. It's an interesting company. There's a lot. There's a, they've done it. They've done, even though they don't have a commercial plant yet, they've done their homework. They've done all. They're on all the cement, you know, approval committees and associations. And uh, cement is a whole interesting industry. I know very little about, but but uh, these guys have been been collaborating with them, providing samples to them for more than ten years now. So I can't hold my breath on that one, but I think it's an interesting one that that will will come will be, will become relevant to us hopefully in the next few years or the next year or so. So the challenges and the opportunity. I mean, I think you know, you guys, everyone here, is in the, who's, who operates or is responsible for a curbside program, you know that it, the glass makes up a significant portion. Uh, as Miles pointed, it, paper is definitely the big, um, big component. But after paper, glass is the next biggest piece by component by weight. Uh, it's ex people expect to recycle it. It's one of the original recyclables, and I think it's tough to sort of to tell people no, take it out. Um, on the other hand, it's it's costly to refine. It, it, it actually, glass has never been a profitable component of the curbside program. The, we, the reason we're even talking about it now, why it's gained so much attention, is because paper, the value of paper, is no longer sort of masking the lack of value in in glass. Um, so maybe that's not a bad thing. It was now actually sort of uh, sort of it's, it's coming to light, but. Uh, 
but it's, it's always been it's, it, the, 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 the competing raw materials for glass is, is sand. It's in other words, you're not competing with oil in the case of paper or virgin fiber or metals. It's a relatively low cost uh, raw material. And so basically the glass, the companies that make the glass bottles are only willing to pay a relatively small amount for uh, assorted product. And it takes a lot to make uh, a glass to the specification of those mills. Uh, glass is very, very abrasive. It eats through conveyor belts. It eats through cement. Uh, so it's an expensive material to process. Um, and even in, you know, I think not so much in the metal, the metal and plastic front, but certain people in the, in the single stream paper recycling world would say that uh, glass can also contaminate uh, the paper. So you add that further downside or challenge associated with glass. Making the glass aggregate, relatively speaking, compared to making pellet for uh, the container market is relatively easy, but that is a low value material, even low, more low value material at that point in, in the outlets for aggregate persuading engineers and uh, departments of public works, roads, and so forth to utilize this when there's an abundant supply of other fill materials out there, it's not a, a given. Um, so I think, that at least in New York, the main sort of or economic argument to recycle glass is not that it's adding value to the curbside program, but the alternative disposal cost in New York is $150 a ton. So if we can recycle it at less than that, that's the sort of economic rationale behind recycling in New York. Obviously, the, the, the environmental one would be there is embedded energy in that glass that you don't want to throw away. Um, so what are the alternatives? There's been discussion about expanding the bottle bill to include additional glass containers, wine and spirits. I know there's some complications associated with that. The distribution network is different than the soda and water net network, but uh, getting wine and spirit bottles out, they're 98% glass. Um, I guess there's some cardboard boxes that have wine, but for the most, maybe those are your boxes, Miles, but most of it is glass. Yeah, so, and and uh, most of it's glass, and, 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 and maybe uh, nickel isn't enough for glass. I, um, aside from getting out of the curbside program, I would say there's other reasons to, to, to put glass into a deposit system. If you don't commingle it with shredded paper and bottle caps and corks and straws and so forth, if it stays separate through that redemption system, it is it's a much cleaner product. It's much more cost effective to actually try and get it back to a specification where it will go back into a higher end use than aggregate or daily cover. So I think there's environmental arguments and, uh, and uh, economic arguments to try and get more glass into the deposit system. <coughs> I know we're going to talk about the deposit system later. We do have a different opinion in the curbside business about plastic and aluminum cans in the, in the deposit system. Those are real revenue generators and it's a very important distinction to us. They are, they we're talking about materials as opposed to uh, products to us. It's all about the material values and whether or not that value, whether that, that product increases the value of the curbside mix and we're able to retain the value of the product through the curbside processing system or whether or not it's, uh, it's detrimental on the curbside side. Front. And then uh, recycled content requirements. Frankly, uh, you know, I was down at the Northeast Recycling uh, Coalition the other day, yesterday there's discussion actually in New York State to put some recycled content laws in out there for glass bottles. I think if the glass industry doesn't step up and, and, and sort of offer a price enough, a high enough price to basically get this glass out of the waste stream, then recycled content laws, those exist. They're not a far-fetched notion. They can be effective. I don't know what the right percentage is, but I mean, if you, if you follow the glass industry, the one glass plant in, in New England uh, that was consuming uh, amber glass, brown glass, shut down in the past year. They had about a 90% recycled glass content in those bottles. Uh, and basically, there's no longer any anyone making glass bottles in the region. There is still one plant in New Jersey. But so it's going further and further away, and the freight eats up any value that's in there. And so basically, it's either going to find another home other or landfill uh, other than, than bottles, or they're going to have to basically be willing to pay to get it to them. So, uh, why is no one making glass bottles? You just said no one's making glass bottles. Why is that? It's, I'm sure there's a lot of complicated economics associated with it and, uh, that, that, that I can't speak to, but certainly it's a, it's a scale business. I mean, just like you don't have steel mills. I don't know where the nearest steel mill is here. Maybe Kevin can speak to that and, and how it differs from, from, from paper mills, but, but it is a very 
consolidated. They, those guys, they run their numbers. They say it's better to sort of consolidate their facilities. Also, maybe where power and labor are cheaper and just move the bottles around. But again, I, 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 there's a, it's a, it's a whole field of why and where those mills choose to be put up or expand or shut down. So, uh, thank you. I, 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 I've been hearing a common theme amongst all the speakers so far is, is that beginning with the end in mind is the quality of the product is more important than the collection of the product and all of this. Is, and this is kind of the EEC question. This is great that you're talking to all the end users in this symposium. What is the regulators doing from the manufacturers and <coughs> to try to maybe make them use different products that are more applicable, like the, the shorter lifespan for a bottle that only has to hold something for three weeks, like someone mentioned earlier, compared to something that has to last forever. And, and in this situation, you know, regulate a little bit more on the side of what are the products being made so the quality at the end will be better and it actually can be an economically feasible market for everybody. Very good. It's a complicated question. I'd like David perhaps to dwell upon it over lunch and then respond it during this session. Because we have work behind and I'd like to keep going. Thank you very much, Bob. Very interesting.
when a, a supplier, a customer wants a product, it's not just about quality. Some people, some consumers can handle a lower quality grade. But with a lower quality grade comes a lower quality price. So when you're looking at the municipal side of recycling, which is somewhat what sparked all of this debate and issues, one of the key problems that government doesn't recognize is that it costs money to do it. And government has sold the public that government's making money. So now you have processors who are saying, hey, I can't make money. I got to charge you a tip fee. I got to raise the rates. And we're in an environment of rising costs. We have new federal DOT rules that are going to effectively double the cost of transportation in the next five years. We have labor minimum wage requirements going up. And not arguing about the minimum wage, but just about it's going up. All the different costs are going up that affect the transportation and movement of goods that sell for pennies. We're all in the penny business. We're not in the thousand dollar business, we're in the penny business. And so we have to have facilities that can handle mass volume, which becomes another issue with the NIMBYs and the cave people. Cave people, citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> which as we all know, I'm sorry for any of the elected officials here, but which as we all know that one cave person is more powerful than all of industry to an elected official. So these are the battles that these types of facilities have to face on a daily basis. So the myth that, that's been put out all over Long Island that you can't recycle, well, that's not true. You can recycle. You just don't like the price of recycling. Whoever said it was going to be free? I can tell you, I'm not revealing anything crazy, but to put the key in the gate at Gershow is $100 a ton. People, when we tell people outside, they look at me like I'm nuts. It's $100 a ton to put the key in the gate. So recycling is going on, but you have an issue on the municipal <coughs> side where you have municipal facilities that move slower than private industry in terms of recognizing what technology is needed to create a better product. And you have a situation whereby they fall behind. And then we, what happened in Long Island, Brookings and all across Long Island, where it became an issue. So you have to invest in technology to make a product that people will want to take. Forget about selling it, just that they'll accept it. <coughs> You have to understand that these facilities are manufacturing facilities. Yes, it's called recycling, but recycling is the transformation of one item into something else, the mechanical or chemical trans transformation. Recycling is not putting it at the curb. That's collection. Another item that you have to recognize that's going to happen over the next decade is that the prices for all items, you can call it scrap, you can call it plastic, call it recycling, it doesn't matter what you call it. All of the prices of the next decade are going to slowly decrease, creating more of an effort in terms of costs. Why is it going to decrease? Because while the United States has a great advanced system of collection, right, on the municipal side, we collect from the homes, on the private side of scrap, we have an advanced scrap collection system. China, Malaysia, India, all of those other nations, advanced in certain things advanced in technology, advanced in military <coughs> warfare, but they're not advanced in the collection system. Just as what was said earlier, that you have nations, small nations, that have no collection system for waste, garbage, let alone items that can be reused for recycling. So as China develops its collection system of not just scrap metal, but plastics and everything else, the world volume is going to increase. This is a supply-demand business. Prices are dictated not by somebody on Wall Street pushing a button. Prices are dictated solely by supply and demand. So what can government do? And, and I'm not going to talk so much about Gershaw, but I'll answer any questions you want. And for those of you that do business, we thank you. And for those that don't, I need to thank you as well. But <laughs> <laughs> But glass is an issue. So Suffolk County has been the first to do lots of things, and our electeds and the county pride itself on it. First, 
to ban smoking, first to ban all kinds of things, first to ban plastic bags. Adrian Esposito's here who pushed that forward. 18 months ago, two years ago, Suffolk County puts out a legislation that the homeowner, when you go to the supermarket, you have to pay a nickel for a plastic bag. We're changing behavior. I personally did then and still don't like that law. I hate paying the nickel. But it changed my behavior, and I don't pay the nickel because I go in with my bag. I keep it in my car. If I don't have it in my car, my wife yells at me who was using bags long before. So I, I want to know, why don't we do something with glass? Why don't we change behavior with glass? Not change behavior at the manufacturer's end, because government's not willing to give them a million eight for every optical sort and the cost of operating. So, yes, as manufacturers, we have to keep up with technology. But where government can help, where EEC can help, where government can help in its own, is creating rules with behavior change. So I would recommend that, hey, we got got to pay a nickel for a bag. Let's pay a quarter for something else that's class-related. Get the class out of the system. Create a higher quality. Get rid of all the other obstacles that glass creates. That's where government can help. So the whole concept designed for recycling, right? We're going to tell the glass manufacturers you got to use a certain amount of recycled content. We've been trying to do that with, with asphalt and aggregate and concrete, and it hasn't worked. The asphalt plants have millions piled to the sky. They can't do <coughs> really enough. So this is a consumer. At the end of the day, it's always a consumer cost. So you got to change the, the behavior of the consumer. And you have to have companies and private partnerships with the municipalities that understand about this. It shouldn't take in Long Island, if you're in Long Island, if you're in Brookhaven and you've got to add a piece of equipment and you need a building, it could take you three years to get a building permit. But meanwhile, we're in a manufacturing business. Manufacturers can't wait. You've got to do it now. Because why? Because if I don't make the product for the steel mill they want, they buy it from somebody else. 1980, when we started shredding at Gershaw, our average waste content, which we shipped to Brookhaven Landfill and still do to this day, was 40% of what we took in. You think of a car, the glass, the plastic, the, the car seats, the dirt that's entangled with the tires and underneath. You think of a washing machine or refrigerator and all the, the foam and plastic in it and other items that we didn't have technology to recover. Today, our average waste is somewhere around 19%. It's not because the manufacturers of the goods, the cars, the appliances, made them better or designed them better for recycling. It was because if we didn't invest in technology to recover those items, we'd be out of business. We're on our most recent adventure is we're, we're now putting outdoor operations inside, but we are effectively an outdoor factory. And one of the things we have to do is we have to build a new plant to recover the aluminums that we recover at the shredding. We do that now. And we make a product that's about 98% metallic. Four or five years ago, it was 93%. And China ate it up, and Malaysia ate it up all day long. But they said, hey, no, no, no. you got to bring the quality up. Now we have to even get it hotter. If we don't make the investment, about 20 million bucks, we won't exist in a short period of time. Do make the investment, we have to manage it, but we will have people that will take our product. So it's about technology, it's about reinvestment, and on the municipal side, I would suggest behavior change by government on the consumer end. Stop forcing it on the private business. Thank you. I'd like you, I'm going to give a round of people a great speech.
you're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm not in the municipal side, but you're talking about changing I'm not behavior. municipal. You're talking about changing the behavior of the consumer to curb. Correct. Correct. That's another myth. The consumer doesn't care. The zealots care. Right. My wife is a zealot. She opens, checks the garbage on me, and I'm in the recycling business, but she checks the garbage on me. You know, I'm right me. here, Kevin. Can we use the word of the zealot side? <laughs> <laughs> the zealot right there, the two zealot. Well, the <laughs> so, no, consumers don't care. That's the myth. The zealots care. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. You call them what you want. The zealots on both ends of the spectrum. The zealots care. And if you can make a rule and educate, put on TV, make it a law, and say you've got to put pink bottles aside, the zealots will do it. But most people don't care. They have enough trouble paying their mortgage and worrying about their kids and the opioid crisis. They don't, plain English, they don't give a shit. I think it's so a 60% zealot? I'm also put it on the curb. a bit of a bigger They question. want to put it on the curb they want it to go away. They want to flip their well, lights the switch. Man, they want the electricity to come on. They don't care how Let's it's Let's let them answer, okay? They, you cannot, you, to change it in that fashion, First of all, we know educating public, whether for good or bad, takes generational time. Let's start educating children to brainwash them. Good or bad for the concept. If you want to change behavior, you change it in the pocketbook. <coughs> At the store, when they have to go buy, and they have to make that decision, do we pay an extra dime or 10 cents for this glass bottle, or do we pay less for the plastic bottle? That's where you change behavior. I'm sorry, because it's very uh, contamination. People use that word all the time, and to, to me, they're very, it's, it's confusion over it. Basically, a, a bowling ball or a sneaker or a garden hose in our stream is contamination. A dirty soda bottle that has grit on it is not a contaminated, it's not a contaminated box. Okay. I think generally, paper gets a little more nuanced because is there too much piece of, piece of grease in the box or not? But contamination is just stuff that's not meant to be in there, as opposed to the fact they didn't rinse out and wash their. What's the garbage you know, man to take? That's what I want. That's the extension for the not the Yeah, the extension for yeah, right. the Let me add, let me add. I'm at Smithton. I live in Smithtown. What is what is the requirements for the bottles and cans? Bottles and cans, no plastic bags. Right? So no plastic bags. 90% at least. 90% of the houses put their bottles in plastic bags. Yes, sir. I've been in the recycling business for 30 years. The question I had when I first started was the scrap bin and all the district. And way back then, uh, the discussion was we have to talk to the people that are manufacturing bottles and things like that, different products. Each of you, have you made any inroads with those that are manufacturing products? For example, biodegradable bottles. These things are getting into the feedstock and the stream. Are you making inroads with them? Is the, the government uh, getting involved with looking at that end of it? Because it's pretty serious. I mean, just today, there was discussions of multiple, like uh, coloring in the plastic. Uh, there's also like different metals or uh, paper products with multi-level things inside it. It's a serious issue. 30 years ago we were talking about it with Israel, and today it's still an issue. More significantly, what's happened? I, I would say, uh, on our front, I mean, we definitely make an inroads. Inroads is itself, yeah, but no, but basically, we, I'm going to say twice a month we have yearly or Procter & Gamble, Henkel, the designers coming to our facility, wanting to us, wanting to understand why this container can be sorted and this one can't. And so does us at a much more technical level, you have APR, the association, various on the plastics front, the association saying this adhesive is going to be a problem at Georgia's shop, this one is not. And so is it certainly if new product comes out and it's got some full shrink wrap label, optical source can't see through it, that those things exist, but I would say that there's a lot of headway that has been made with with the stuff be sortable and then be marketable after the sortable. Okay. I have sorry. Chris Andre 4K. I'm gonna have to disagree somewhat with the contamination issue because it seems to me from a municipal standpoint, you know, contamination is a moving target. When markets are robust, we never hear any problems with contamination, right? Bring us more, bring us more, bring us more. That's great, bring us more. The markets tank. Everybody's like, whoa. The material that you're sending us is crap. The material I was sending you when I was getting paid for it. And 
So I think the definition of contamination is, is just a moving target somewhat. I, 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 you know, you said a, a bottle that's got written it is, is okay. Um, well, we've had issues where we were sending material and it wasn't okay. So I, I think the idea of contamination is more complicated and I think it's directly tied to how the market is doing. It's a relative topic rather than a solid <coughs> Uh, yes. I have a question for uh, George. We had this conversation at the beginning, but I don't think we completed the conversation. Because of what we have in Long Island, we have a big issue with glass. So I did check with uh, you regarding that. You have a very good infrastructure of the plant that you have. What is the feasibility in using glass for your plant? And you have a very good optical sorter, and you do the cleaning of the plastic, and um, at the end, you have a testing lab as well. And at the end, we can maybe tie in an Andalab algorithm um, to create a DOT grid material. I mean, just curious to know if it is feasible to have glass at your plant as well. Uh, no, it's not feasible for my plant to run glass, but there, there, I, I believe there are machines that are designed to sort glass optically, uh, but it's very expensive. Glass is worth one, one of the issues I found, and you know, when we've tried to price out glass processing recently, the problem is one island sand. You know, you're not going to be able to necessarily sell it as a market, although you know, we've been told that that's not a main factor. But just to, if someone is you know, taking say, natural sand, uh, they're reluctant to take a processed material whatever reason, of course, the labels or uh, the syrup in it, blah, blah, blah. So it is a, a, a marketing issue versus the, the capital effect. <coughs> course of time, going to run out. Oh, Adrian, I have to uh, let you go. Yeah, I feel compelled to respond once we've called zealot by Mr. <laughs> Gershwin, <laughs> but also to defend the public a little bit. Um, we talk a lot about uh, changing public behavior. As someone who spent 35 years in the business of changing public behavior, it never happens from education alone. So it takes rigorous, thoughtful, meaningful public education, but also incentivization, some type of government incentivization that um, allows for that education to manifest and change the behavior. It's not one or the other. So I think uh, on the issue of recycling, Dave was just saying to me, you know, it took anti-smoking 30 years, it took other social movements 30 years, why not recycling? And to me, it's because the laws are still weak. You know, um, we have a lot of not, remember when we wanted to have non-smoking in the bars and restaurants, and it was like we had said we're gonna, you know, take away your lease to your house. Uh, people went crazy. Bars would close, restaurants would close, and now we've just made the transition and everyone, no one cares. And nothing ever closed um, because of it. So I think a lot of it has to do with not only letting the public know why we need to take a different action, but also providing that incentivization and in many cases the legislation to change that behavior. I know that Kevin said people don't care, but I do want to say I believe people do care. People want to do the right thing. They need to know why they're doing it, why it's an inconvenience, and they need some help in assisting with that change. So I think I think we can do this. We just need to make a lot more changes. Thank you.